So hello everyone and welcome along to episode two in the Breathing Sciences podcast by Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute. Uh, My name's Aaron, I look after the marketing side of PVRI uh, and I'm joined today by Professor Gazwan Boutras who is Professor of Cardiopulmonary Sciences at the University of Kent and he's also the President Emeritus of PVRI, no stranger to most of our community. So thanks very much Gazwan for for joining me today. for this episode it's it's going to be an exciting one i think um have you how have you been over the last few months how are you uh, uh how are you doing with with your research and, and all of the i know you're a very busy guy outside of uh of the sciences as well well the lockdown has been a blessing uh, one way or another because it gives us an opportunity to catch up with a lot of things which we have not been able to do and uh, spending some time, you know, uh, reading and writing in general. Uh, most of the time I'm spending in this room, so um, it is okay. I cannot complain, actually. Thank you. The only thing so, is I cannot see people, you know, but that's, uh, everybody is like that. Soon, yes, no, we're, we're all itching to, uh, to get out and to, yeah. to, to, see, to see people again. So a lot of people know you as kind of, you know, the godfather of, uh, of sildenafil and, and the golf of you know the pvri as well um but just more broadly if you know people haven't um come across you or your work um you know you're trained uh, you know in the practicing field of cardiac arrhythmia cardiac uh, electrophysiology and you've worked on oh, extensively on issues such as wolf parkinson white syndrome qt intervals management of cardiac arrhythmias uh, and early development of catheter ablation um, and then to top it all off, development of one of the uh, defeltidide, if, if that's how I say it properly, um, antiarrhythmic drug in the early 90s. Um, so what, what made you change to pulmonary vascular diseases and, and pH after all of that? Well, uh, it's like uh, any stories of any uh, career um, physicians and uh, scientists. Um, as you rightly said, I started in electrophysiology uh, as a trainee in the 1980s. Um, at that time, cardiac electrophysiology was not the biggest subject in cardiology, not as us as today. Uh, but we were very few centers who, in the UK and even within the USA who was doing that. So it was a real fun, you know, but um, uh, the subject have actually um, progressed extensively over the last uh, 10 years. One of the topics I had been interested in was actually on the ventricular repolarization. And uh, I, uh, and mainly for the physicians that mean QT interval in general. So I've been uh, doing some work uh, on QT in addition to many other things in cardiac arrhythmias, of course. And uh, for that reason, I was approached by, um, at that time, Pfizer, who said they have developed a new drug that prolonged QT interval. At that time, prolongation of QT interval was considered a very advantageous thing, although, as every cardiac uh, cardiologist know these days, that it is not always the right things to do, but uh, that is later. So, uh, I had that drug, which was later on called the uh, uh, as when I was at St. George's Hospital. Uh, I, by the way, I started at St. Bartholomew's, then moved to St. George's. Uh, uh, at that time with my mentor, Professor John Tam. So I uh, uh, started to do some work with the dofetalite in the intra, uh, in giving it intravenously. And it was amazing to me how it actually prolonged QT interval on my vision when I saw it on the screen and on the paper uh, during in the cath lab. So uh, I start to, you know, see this drug as an interesting phenomena to study more on QT interval and ventricular repolarization. Then I spent one year in, um, in 1990 uh, in um, uh, United States in New York in the VA um, working on ventricular uh, tachycardia. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, Pfizer approached me and he said, we need your help into the development of this. And, uh, and it 
I almost, you know, um, reluctantly accepted it at that one stage, but later on I found that this is, could be an opportunity to develop more research. So I told Pfizer is, if they will give me the freedom to do uh, all the scientific research and have still have a lab and doing something. And they've been very good uh, into this uh, part. So anyhow, I spent all these uh, uh, many years as a chief scientific advisor to them and uh, uh, I worked in developing the, the fatal line, which was later on approved. Uh, that was in the 1990s. And then by that particular time, there was another group, which is I'm not was related to at all, uh, who was developing sildenafil uh, 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 as an anginal drug in the early 90s, when later on, they start to discover uh, serendipitously uh, the um, the erectile uh, dysfunction, uh, like, you know, uh, value of these drugs in the treatment of erectile dysfunction. So the development of that drugs developed into erectile dysfunction and become the first drug, as everybody knows, uh, in the erectile dysfunction, and they abandoned the the China story. But probably because it was not as strong as the uh, available at that time at the drugs. Anyhow, in 1998, uh, both Dufetalite was approved for antiarrhythmic drugs um, uh, in the United States and in Europe, as well as the Sildenafil was approved in 1998. But of course, the uh, Media was more interested in in Sildenafil being erectile dysfunction, naturally. Uh, um, and as for many of you who knows how the industry works, is that once the drug is becoming, you know, approved, it is now uh, being managed by the marketing and the research uh, tool while we in the research and development start to do something else. So at that time, uh, one of the directors at your, uh, approached me and he said, Kazan, you know, uh, you are a scientific advisor. Can you advise us if there is any other alternative for the use of salt and seal? Well, I mean, to be honest, I did not know anything about that subject other than it was being suggested for, uh, for uh, angina and as an anti-angina drugs in general. So I said, well, I'll see, I'll try. So I spent a lot of time in the library, as I always describe it in a monkish uh, attitude of uh, sitting in my cells, uh, uh, isolating myself from the rest of the world. Sometimes lockdown is useful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and I spent about almost three months, uh, as I always describe it to my younger uh, fellows, uh, uh, working with uh, dusty volumes of all the literature in the library. Remember, at that time, we did not have the advantage of everything online in, in general, so I have to spend hours. So I usually, I looked around, amazing me is that discovered or Notice from the old literature, which was not a common knowledge, you know, for us or at that time. But what was in the literature is that the PD5 inhibitor, the phosphodiesterate inhibitor, was actually present in the lung and it was been isolated from the lung. So oh, that's interesting. And it is in the vascular of the lung. That's another interesting phenomenon. And then I um, uh, looked at some of the old. Uh, um, drugs which are PD-5 inhibitor, not sildenafil, but an old PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, and they found it to be useful in reducing the pulmonary pressures in mice model. So I thought the idea is that if it is available in the lung and if it is high in the lung and it produces it, probably it could be useful for pulmonary hypertension, you know, uh, in one way or another. So oh, to be honest, when I wrote, uh, I wrote about 22 pages uh, to justify the use of salt and I feel permanent attention to these directors so that I can't, they can't think about it as an alternative. But this was not the only idea. There was about six more ideas for using a salt and I feel other. And permanent attention was probably the third one or something like that. Anyhow, uh, you see, one of the uh, things in the pharmaceutical company people never realize about is that that's, there are at certain stages of their working environment give different uh, uh, 
a freedom to scientists in general to work without being interference or nobody is interested in general. So uh, I spent some time sitting with um, Dr. Steve Felsted, who was at that time my director, and he was a very nice scientist and very receptive to all the ideas. And we, I said to them, I mean, this pulmonary hypertension could be interesting um, in general. He said, oh, so let's just um, develop it. And so what do you think? I said, yeah, but we need to do study. And he said, how, would, how do you start? I said, well, the obvious thing so is to start it in the cardiac lab. Uh, and then we can find, you know, um, give it to cardiac lab and study the effects on the pulmonary pressures and in some patient who had some pulmonary hypertension in general. And this is another interesting phenomena which will probably never happen if, if it is today, uh, is that but we need some funding for that. And I said, well, I mean, you know, the pharmaceutical company, they usually put their budget in early in the beginning of the year, and uh, then there is a plan for spending it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we didn't have any money at that time, you know. So, so he said, "I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to call, call uh, one of the superiors in in the United States and see if he can give us some money. How much you want?" I said, "No, oh, something like five hundred thousand dollars or something to do the studies." So I just phoned him at that time, and this is the first time I'm mentioning it. Actually, <laughs> uh, he phoned him and he said, "Oh yeah, we got one study which was cancelled, and just all this money left over it, and we, I mean, it's." been allocated and therefore no allocation to it anymore. Uh, okay, you can have it. <laughs> That's how it is. Okay, so that is a part of the story within the company. But then the other story is to do it at the, uh, and then, and the ticket, and that's an uh, within the investigators. And that's another interesting phenomenon. I see. So let me ask you, you said there were maybe five other possibilities for sildenafil at that time. How come you chose to run with pH as a, as a kind of a treatment? And I mean, it, I, I kind of got the sense that it was a particularly contrarian uh, way of, of thinking about sildenafil. Is that true? It was being thought about and it was not being shelved, but we thought about it. But then with the progress, people start to not have an uh, interest just because they don't have the time to do it. I use it for, for example, angina, to do certain type of angina, to get nitri nitric, um, uh, nitrate resistant angina, uh, these kind of things, you know, and even neuropathies and things like that. But, okay. uh, you know, I mean, it was there, but, uh, uh, the appeal for the pulmonary hypertension is in being a cardiologist and I can do it in the cardiac lab, you know, is, is, is an appeal. And also it looks very interesting in general. And particularly there was no drug at that time for pulmonary hypertension other than prostacycline, as you know, which is not an easy drug to use in general. Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, so, uh, and there was no oral therapy, of course, three years later, it was an appeal, but that is, because I'm talking in 1997, 1998, you know, particular. So uh, I wrote a protocol and I went to see some of the physician. And the first physician I met was Professor Tim Hengelbottom. Now, Tim is now, uh, I think, he's the head of the faculty of the pharmaceutical industry or something like that now, but he was one of the prominent pulmonary hypertension physicians in the UK. He was in Sheffield and before he was in Cambridge. So I still I remember met him in the Royal Society of Medicine and I started talking. He said, and then after, you know, he was, he was a very quiet guy. This is the first time I met him. Now we know each other very well, but I said in the first time. And he said uh, to me the question, and by the way, uh, what is this drug you are talking to me about? And I was a bit uh, trying to be shy of, because I have to say it is Viagra, because the word Viagra is a different thing. He said, oh, oh, interesting. And then he said one thing to me, and he said, you know, Kazran, people are dying in a cardiac cath of these patients. Remember at that time, we only deal with a very severe patients. You know, it's not like nowadays. Um, and do and you think that if I give Viagra to this patient who is for erectile dysfunction, uh, you know, a lifestyle drug, and if this patient died, what is going to happen? Okay. That was his suspicion in general. And I said to him, Tim, 
I understand what you are saying, but for me, the science is very appealing. All these literatures, all the literatures suggesting it is in the lung, in the pulmonary vasculatures, and it may, and there are some of these animal experiments. So there is a good appealing science behind it. You know, it's not just like that. And if we do it in a very careful way, we will probably be able to do it. So we will probably start with a very tiny amount and then we will start to increase it and, and we will monitor the patient very carefully. Sure, so the, the narrative of sildenafil as you know, a, a recreational drug as, such as Viagra spilled over into the lab or, or in the clinic and doctors would be scared to try this out on their patients because they True. would be telling them, they'd, right, I see. despite the science. So, yeah. Well, what is reasonable, I mean, and I'm not saying anything is done. Anyhow, to get the short story long, I mean, we, I, I'll talk to many other things. Some people will say, I want to start with animal experiments first, you know. Uh, um, anyhow. Uh, so would you say that's the, that was the main challenge with, you know, the That's the first challenge. That's the first challenge to be thinking. But, the way the challenge has been miraculously also, there's always there is miracles in medicine and always there is a good chance and bad chance, of course. Uh, if that had caused any side effects for the in one patient with many drugs, I can tell you, I mean, if you look in the history of development of a drug with many drugs being given and for one reason or another, the side if these rare side effects appeared and the drug was killed. But to be resurrected 20 years later because people realized that this was not, you know, just one incident. The good things within this and uh, have is that Tim Butter did not want to give it to pulmonary hypertension patient who was a primary or idiopathic or the severe one. So uh, he, he wanted to try it because he probably I persuaded him or he just doesn't want to upset me. I don't know. So he gave it to the first patient who is pulmonary hypertension and COPD. Now, this is supposed to be a less risky patient or to, be, to a certain extent. And for miraculously, the, the drop in the pulmonary pressure was so phenomenal that Tim Higginbottom, who worked with process cycling, because he was one of the leaders of the process cycling development in the early days, worked with the nitric oxide and other things, could not believe that. I still, he called me at 6.30 in the evening uh, while I was at home, and he said to me, Jesuan, you are absolutely right. I've never seen such a drop in the pulmonary pressure. He was become really convinced of that because if this drop, now, by the way, this drop was also exceptionally big, you know, from what we know nowadays, the effect of the drug. But it happened, and happened for the first time. So, to cut the long story short, <laughs> Tim Higginbottom started to prescribe it to the patients without telling me, because he knows that I will object on that. So, he prescribed it to three patients who are in critical positions or even, you know, if it is at that time, they have to give them process acting, but for one reason or another, they couldn't. And he didn't tell me at all for almost a year. Because he knows I will object on that, you know, in one way, as I said. But later on, I have been forced to call me to tell me that these three patients are on drug for one year, or one of them six months, I think. But because one of them was a son of a professor who is his colleague, and he wants to go back to Iceland, so he would not be able to have enough supply because, you know, this drug was only given one tablet per time, you know, it's a political dysfunction. So he said, can you give him a drug? And we said, no way, I can't do that. But what is that? Did you give it to these patients? He said, yes, I have it, and they are doing very well, and their six-minute walk test is doing very well things. Oh. Well, I said that's fantastic in general. But at that particular time, we had actually did some uh, other uh, patients, you know, other centers. But I'm just telling you, you know, a very short story. So the second, anyhow, so that was happening, and everybody went, 
people start to talk, you know, physician talk in the bars, <laughs> the meetings about, you know, and it's become like a joke. I remember in 1999, I was attending American Heart meeting, and there was a meeting uh, dedicated to pulmonary hypertension in the American Heart Association meeting. And you know, not like today, there was only 30, 40 people sitting in the room. And I remember, you know, one of the prominent physicians at that time giving a talk uh, in 1999, and he said sarcastically, that and some people giving sildenafil for pulmonary hypertension. Oh, there's a big laughter in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the <laughs> But the real things, which you know, the things become uh, people. The, as I, I as I said, by the word of the mouth, become excited about it, uh, and because something they could not afford it, because at that time the only things available is this process cycling. You know, as you know, so. Uh, I think Tim Higginbottom was consulted for one patient who is a young man who had a heart failure, severe heart failure for the cardiac transplant, giving natural oxide and process cycling, and he was not doing anything. And he was for the heart transplant. He was very young in his early 20s. So they, they, they don't know what to do. So probably they, maybe, I'm not saying, I can't say that, but there is a possibility that physicians at that time who was Michael Kotsoulis, uh, now Professor Kotsoulis, who is one of the uh, main congenital heart diseases uh, guys in this country, uh, suggested let's try him with sildenafil and they gave him 175 and 200 milligram. Remember at that time we were starting with 25 milligram and we are seeing the effects as 25 milligram. That was a small little letter to the editors published in New England Journal. And I think I got a note for that. It was in 2000, 2000. Um, uh, anyhow, so it was there. And I read it for the first time and I was surprised and I thought that this is too much. So I found Michael Cotillis introducing myself to, we know each other now very well, but that's at that time. I said, Michael, uh, Dr. Cotillis, this is, I think 100 milligrams too much for this patient. Oh, by the way, 100 milligram five times a day. So it is a, a tremendous dose. And he said, I don't know what we're doing. Uh, I'm just, uh, we try to help him because, but he's doing very well. Uh, that's why they put it into the letter to the editors and the patient is moving around and things like that. And by the way, this patient almost taking out of the transplant list he entered university and he's still alive. Wow. <laughs> so that is an interesting story. So I said to him, uh, we let's reduce the drugs. You know, I mean, I cannot say anything, but I'm telling you what I have seen in the Kafka. Sure. You know, with all these stories, so then I feel become, uh, people start to use it a lot, of course, off label. Let, let me ask you then. So you said that you, you, you know, um, when Tim started using this as a therapy, for, for some of his patients who are particularly ill, um, you know, you might have been surprised to get the call from him to say, I'm, I'm using it as a therapy. Um, and then you've got the word of mouth sort of marketing element to it as well. How was, was the program with Pfizer to develop this as a, as a therapy for pH done and dusted then after that? Or how would that news have affected you uh, or affected the program with Pfizer on the path to becoming there, an approved therapy? There was... You see, Pfizer is like any uh, people never realize that industry doesn't work. I mean, uh, like what people think it is. Inside industry, you can find camps, you can find skeptical camps, you can very enthusiastic camps, you can have marketing camps, you are very academic camps, etc. So there is a big of mixture with that. Few people around me, especially in within in Sandwich where we were working, were very pro for this. People in New York were all against it. And the reason I can't tell you that is that when I started the intravenous, the New York guys completely against it. They even say, you are not, we will not allow to be used in the United States. This is one of the reasons why my uh, uh, Sammy Grant has not been able to do the study was he was one of the people I know since he was doing the studies. But, you know. 
So, but because of the freedom we have to use in sandwich, not anymore, you know, uh, pharmaceutical company keep changing. But at that time, there was a lot of freedom to give into the research activities. They didn't uh, stop us, but they completely, and people I remember, they just say, do you think that if, because it was being sold and, you know, with all this, uh, you know, this is a sold in a field for erectile dysfunction, and it is a big seller, you know, at that time. Well, relatively big. Um, uh, and there were people are afraid of it in general. So they are afraid for what I was been doing, and I have been opposed to do a lot in New York, and they even for me in general. And it remains like that till 2011, uh, sorry, 2001. Uh, when, um, you know that, if you know with the story of the field in the 1999, there was a couple of patients who misused it, uh, a giant patient who had it during their intercourse, they died suddenly. So the American Heart Association removed it or become a dangerous drug for any patient who have heart diseases. So some of the people, uh, when, but because the stories I told you about, and there were many other stories, I used to receive letters from patients taking it now, of course, a favor, but you can't do nothing, you know, it is, you can buy it from the market. Um, uh, people will start to say, do you think that this is actually can be considered as an advantage to drugs and therefore that black label, or it's not a black label, but it was a kind of a caution that it cannot be given to heart diseases, it should be, can be improved. So there were start, few people start to give me some support in New York, but yes, many in New York were against it in general. And because of that, I start to be suppressed in Pfizer for almost two years, I become probably a pariah to some people because I, I start to feel that I'm doing a good job because there are patients writing me letters and there are some improvement and there are some good things. But a lot of the people are, they're scared, not because of anything, but because they just say, we're giving it to a very uh, risky disease, which is pulmonary hypertension. Anyhow, so, I mean, I remember, uh, and I have to say it for the first time again, I was sitting in on, at home, I told my wife, I'm going to give up about this because everybody is against me into that in, in, in the company. Um, and uh, my wife, she said, no, you shouldn't, you should have to continue doing that because look at all these letters that you receive from patients. I mean, you cannot betray them, you know, in general or another. So it was a very hard time for me. But, as I said, always miracle can happen and hope is always there, even if you say you've lost hope. At that particular time in 2002, um, a chap called Duncan Duncan became the head of Sandwich Laboratories. Duncan, who you know very well, I'm sure, uh, was a very enlightened man. And when he arrived, he started to ask all the scientists and to talk to them. So he asked me about the pulmonary hypertension, about what are you doing? And then show him the result of pulmonary hypertension. He said, oh, that's a very nice opportunity. That's to be tell of then came in on that. So Doug, Doug Dugan uh, was uh, very interested, but that's it. I said, okay, a lot of them are like that. You know, they always speak like that. That was in around November. In the Pfizer's, or, you know, more the company, they usually put banners in the halls about their annual achievements. So there was a banner. I, one day I was walking to the, to the restaurant and I saw a big banner, Sandwich Achievement, Development of Pulmonary Hypertension. Oh. <laughs> it was the surprise which changed everything. Anyhow, the bottom line is that it was adopted by Sandwich people, thanks to Dr. Kenny who speared it and immediately asked to develop a team to develop it. And from there, we started having the oral therapy or the study that later on uh, lead to the development of sildenafil, which as you know, three years and the drug was approved 
uh, other about you. Cool. So looking back now then on, on that whole process, I mean, it sort of sounds like you've been through the wars with it. I know that it probably took quite a, a toll on, on yourself, um, both professionally and personally, being that contrarian um, to, to pursue this line of therapy. Um, it's quite a story. I mean, would you do it again on reflection? Was there any, any key points that you sort of would well, I mean, think about? Uh, uh, yes, I would. Uh, and uh, I look in my age now, but I would encourage the younger people to behave in, in, in some form of, to not always, you see, I become a student of history of science. And during the last 20 years, I read a lot of history of science, especially during after my retirement, I spent a lot of time reading, you know, scientists, all the scientists, the majority, the biggest things usually and are suffered from all discovery because people love to have the status quo or a modification of status quo. Even journals, they will never publish something which is a very unique, unusual or things like that. Because I remember one day I was talking to one guy from Nobel, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, uh, whom I know very well. And I said to him, how is your paper that you got a Nobel Prize for was being accepted? He said, no, I published it in the third level journal because nobody of the big journal want to publish it. And it's the same thing, Albert Einstein suffered. Louis Pasteur, he always been thought, you know, that his, he was, his idea is that, but later on proved that. So, in the history of science, scientists are very conservative and they would like to have the status quo as a normal. And even the journals nowadays, a lot of the journal, all of the publish is me too, a bit of modification of what we know or improvement. But if you give a new, completely unusual theory or ideas, they will be very reluctant and so often will be rejected and probably the scientists will be forced to find a third degree journal who are accepting it very quickly in general. So yes, this is not unusual in the history of science for me, as I, as I now recall from learning about history. And you think the environment is pretty much the same now? I mean, you've had, the, I guess, the, uh, the hindsight of coming at this from an industry um, perspective. Do you think the current um, academic process, getting funding, being peer reviewed, is fertile for, for these um, you know, other ways of thinking? Or do you think it doesn't encourage uh, wild ideas? Well, I'll tell you one thing. You said industry or academia. There is no difference between industry and academia. It is the same mindset in both sides. Industry is mainly interesting in selling uh, their drugs and getting some. Academia are mainly interesting in publishing and have some names and uh, <laughs> get some kind of accreditation or uh, job uh, progress. Human beings are the same. The mentality is the same. The environment is the same. Even in academia, there are skeptics. There are people who are very open-minded and accepted even weird idea. Uh, the same in the industry. It is make no difference. And it is not only today. I have noticed that when I study the 17th century scientists, 18th century scientists, 19th century scientists, they are always the same. If you read the scientific, scientific history, not from you know these guys which they always glorify scientists, most of the scientists have really suffered a lot, especially these who are really made a lot of changes in their first 40, 40 years of their career, because their new ideas that is now become the established idea has been rejected or unaccepted or considered crazy or unscientific. They always call it all these terms in general. Mm -hmm. So that is why my advice to the young scientist, be creative, do not afraid from this. If you are really convinced and you have followed the scientific methodology, the scientific thinking, the logic, not just to be, you know, I mean, there are also crazy ideas that it doesn't uh, work at all. I mean, nothing wrong with that <laughs> or nothing new. But if you are really convinced and having, you know, a good scientific background behind it and good experiment following the scientific methodology in the proper way, and you find something which is unusual, do not be afraid from the opposition. Mm -hmm. you know. 
Excellent. So then, as I understand it, if we fast forward a little bit to 2005, 2006, you must have come across some like minded individuals along the way, along this sort of process. Um, and you're one of the founding members of PVRI, Pomerascular Research Institute. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how did that idea come about and what were the beginnings uh, you know, and, and the thinking for the purpose of the organisation? Well, uh... In the 1990s, when we started doing the Saldanafil work, uh, pulmonary hypertension become a kind of a small community. But it's a small community which was being encapsulated within a, you know, a smaller number of cases because, first of all, uh, the, the condition was considered very rare because we could not diagnose it. But also because we didn't have a drug, but the first drug which appears is prostacycline, followed by Bozotan and uh, United Therapeutic T15, and then Sildenafil, of course. The interests start become more and more, but it was a very fragmented society of uh, or organization or group of people, uh, and it is not as well shared. I mean. Uh, there was no even specialist in pulmonary hypertension. I mean, most of them are either pulmonary or cardiologists with few cases of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, I am, um, uh, uh, you know, because I spent all my time on pulmonary hypertension since 1998, I start to see that there is no real coherent things. So I start to show that this is not the first time I've established an organization. I've already established my other organization, like the pacing groups and other things before. But that is the so I close on something new. So I said, why don't we have a group of people dedicated to do uh, collaborative research? Because these things cannot be done by one center. So uh, I took an advantage of one of the meetings um, that Pfizer was organizing with, you know, investigator meetings and consultation meeting and i met uh, uh and asked martin wilkins and Ardi gafrani and i said would you like to come with me to a small little room i just want to talk to you privately so of course this is nothing to do with the company and nothing to do with the uh, Pfizer at that time i said i think we need to establish you know small little uh, groups whereby we can work together in research I knew Martin because Martin approached me because he started to work with all the chiefs, uh, Almas, the late Almas Ali chiefs, you know, in Kazakhstan, you know, for pulmonary hypertension and high altitude. And I knew Martin, uh, uh, Ardi, because he started to develop pulmonary hypertension because they developed their um, uh, in health uh, prostacyclines and as well as uh, their interest in, in Sildenafil itself in general. So they said, yeah, that's a great idea. So we were thinking of a small little scientific groups, never thought it could end up with a PVRI as it is now <laughs> in general. So uh, that ideas were just a kind of, okay, interest between these three of us. So that is exactly what, ha what happens in the early days, 2005. And then we, we, we kept uh, talking and things, and uh, we, I said, we probably we may need to include other people. So I called Mark Simigran, I called Evangelos, I called Stuart Rich. These are the people I called and I say, we want to establish a thing. And of course, Mark Simigran is among one of the younger generation. He is in my age group, you know, at that time. Evangelos is one of the younger people. I mean, the only old person, I'm, well, I mean, relatively older, but he's only th three years older than me, you know, is Stuart Rich, but his position is much more an international, you know, at that time. And of course, so he said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then after the discussion, we decided that how about we can meet together in London? Of course, there's no industry funding, no industry backing for it, but we have to pay for our jobs. Uh, for our flights and things, but we will spend only one night and we will do it in Heathrow so that you can come in and out, you know, quickly. And that was the the one night meeting we were starting to talk about having it. And it is at that meeting when we started to think to develop the principle of having an educational institute that, well, it is a research institute to start with, 
that will have also educational so that we can get more people interesting and we can work together uh, on research activities in general. And, uh, and that is probably the beginning of the so-called PPRI, it wasn't called PPRI at that time, and, and even wasn't called an institute at that time. So uh, Martin was very kind and he said, listen, I mean, we need to give it a word of institute. I have been given the idea to, to register it as a company uh, and as a, as a charity, uh, but uh, I cannot give it the word institute. And it was called Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute. Uh, or actually called pulmonary hypertension. So there was many names, you know, I think in its I minutes, mean, I can't remember now, so many years ago. Um, anyhow, but Martin said, I'll tell you one thing, I will call the Minister of Health, uh, Education, who I know, if she can approve to be called institutes, because once it's that approved, then it will be called an institute by the company house. And he managed it. Uh, and to be honest, I because I was working, you know, my office was in Pfizer's, uh, and I have my colleagues uh, who are very sympathetic, you know, who work on pulmonary hypertension. As I said, we just chat, and one of them is called Mark Edwards, and Mark Edwards uh, was a very, very nice guy, very linguistic and uh, interesting in this. And I mentioned to him, I, you know, I'm coming to establish this. And of course, nothing to do with the company, you know. And he and I said, I'm struggling to find a name for it, you know, in general. And after we just shot, he called it, he said, how about we call it Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute, which is PVRI, which is similar to the PVRI of the disease, or one of the parameters of the disease. So it is Mark Edwards who gave it that name <laughs> in general. Okay, so that is for history you know, in general. So immediately I called uh, uh, Martin and I said, how are you called PPRI? Said, oh, that's a good idea. And so everybody accepted it without any, any anything. The logo was not established yet. I will come to the logo later. So uh, we registered things like that. And then um, after that, we start to discuss that um, uh, we need to now uh, get bigger. So I called Stuart, at, that was in October 2016, and I said, we can have a meeting and we have to meet in somewhere uh, which is easy. And we come in, in January when we have, I mean, that is why the story, it's still in January, the February meeting, uh, where there are no other meetings and it is immediately after New Year so that people have just come from holiday. I'm not going for another holiday or another meeting. Uh, and it's probably cheaper to get these things. So we decided to go and uh, I don't know how we later on accept, uh, get into Malta as an, an alternative. So just to um, help people out who, who don't know where these guys are from. So we had Stuart Rich, who is a uh, US base. You okay, I'll tell, you one thing. I, I'll tell you one thing. I, I had a picture of the, because it is in my collection and it is in the front of me. If you like to show it to you and then we can talk about it. One sure. second. I, uh, these are the picture which was taken. Uh, sorry. Uh, one second. So this is the Heathrow. The Heathrow picture. meeting. Okay. And uh, and these are all the discussion during the 2006 was with them actually. Can you see it? Yeah. Good. Cool. So here is, uh, can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can see the mouse. Yeah. Okay. It was done with my camera, which is a very digital camera of the 2006, which is not a very good uh, resolution, but the best I can have, you know. Ardi, young Ardi, young Martin, Evangelos, myself, Fritz Kriminger, who was working with Ardi, Stuart Rich and, and uh, Mark Simigran. These are the people who met in Malta, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Heathrow in, in February 2006. And these are the people who put all the foundation and I have a minute for this meeting, which all the ideas of what we have to do in general. So, I mean, even here, there's a, a very international focus Right, well, we yeah. from... I mean, we got Canada, uh, USA, and Germany, and UK, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So I called, uh, uh, and at that time, we said, 
Martin will become the secretary. I will be the secretary. Uh, Stewart being more one of the senior, I mean, in the uh, reputation with the parliament to be the president, and Martin will be the vice president. And everybody accepted that. So in October, as I said to you, I talked to Stewart and uh, I said to him, Stewart, uh, you know, let us get more people now so that we can enlarge it in general. We selected 25 people. I am sorry, I don't have the picture of the 25, but if you like, I can send it to you. You can put it later on into the thing. Sure. Uh, uh, selected 25 people uh, to come to Malta. They all come on their own expenses. Uh, but uh, we did some logistics and I said to Martin, we don't have any money, you know. So he said, I'll tell you one thing. I got some donation from some patients uh, who said that they wanted for education and research. And this is a good cause for that. So we can use this money. That is the first source of money we got for the PDR. Uh, so we met in Malta. Uh, in uh, I think it was Hayat Agency or something like that. Uh, I think I do have, yeah, all right, right. So uh, we met in, in, in Malta and then that is how we, and then we discussed it. This is where we establish the modus operandi of the PVRI. It was called PVRI at that time. We established the idea of uh, 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 task forces. <laughs> Establish the idea of task forces, and it is there. Um, Jason was there. He had the idea of the textbook. He had the idea of a journal, and it was presented with a slides presentation at that time. We had the idea of schistosomiasis uh, uh, and other things. Okay, and. Um, uh, many other things, you know, and uh, congenital diseases and regional task forces. Uh, so, yeah, so these are the 25 people who are actually met in Malta. It is there, I, I remember uh, one interesting thing from uh, Norbert Vokal, who was there. Norbert said to me, you know, Kazan, this is the best things for this, uh, uh, in our you know, for this uh, discipline of our have attention can happen. And I hope that it will be big. I said, I don't think so. I mean, it's going to be only a small group of people. I mean, it's just small things, you know, in general. There was some opposition from some quarters and everybody knows that. And that is uh, mainly because of the industry uh, rivalry rather than anything else, uh, not personal of the scientists in general, but it is. And you know, the industry has a big saying into how physicians behave sometimes. Anyhow, so, uh, and I said to um, uh, well, um, Norbert, because he's an artist, how about you started to think about the logo? <laughs> I thought that Martin was looking, uh, Norbert was looking around, you know, in the evening, sketching something, you know. And then he came with me with the idea of a heart and a cross behind it, which is a Malta cross. Uh, so he said, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it represent the, and I said to him, but yeah, but the, uh, the cross, uh, uh, it looks very local, you know, rather than anything else. So we start to modify it. And if you remember the first uh, logo we have is that we, it is like a cross, but we stretch it around the world <laughs> into <laughs> from coming from the heart, you know. I'll put it on the screen as well. Yeah. Yeah. After yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that was how the first logo appears. Right. And then, uh, uh, okay, we established that, we started that, and uh, Jason started to work on the book. And of course, the book took four years, as you know, it is becoming the biggest, uh, I think, <laughs> as you know, it is a, a real volume. <laughs> that is thanks to Jason. We wanted to call the PVRI textbook of pulmonary habitations, but the 
publisher did not want to do call it that bad because people I was unknown, you know. So for them, it's not a good marketing thing. If we are publishing today, we would definitely call it this. Uh, but that is how it is. Uh, but uh, so that is how it's going. The, the other milestone happened, and I just want to mention it before I stop here. Uh, that is, we always decided that we will keep having a social activity during international meeting to keep the collegiality uh, rule. As you probably know, we still have it until now. Uh, so the first one we met is actually was in uh, New Orleans at that time, the ATS in 2007. Remember, Malta was happening in January 2007. So, and uh, I met uh, Seward, myself, I think, uh, Marty probably can't remember, and we invited Marlene Ravavinich, being one of the else prominent people. In also Holiday Inn, one of the small Holiday Inn Express in, uh, in New Orleans, not far away from the meeting. And um, um, uh, Marlene, she said, listen, I mean, it doesn't look you know by because there are many other organizations like the PHA and all the things which deal with these kind of things. But what we are really lacking is the global aspects of the problem. And it is the Marlene insisting on the global aspects that give the PVNI the global uh, uh, flavor that we are now enjoying in it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that is, and then the PVNI has become, you know, uh, uh, a kind of uh, a, a small organization with 25 people, which probably by the end of the year 2007, we end up with 70 people as a number. So, uh, yeah, from 2006, I said we've got about 11 years there where you were managing uh, PVRI and, and, the, and the meeting, of, I guess, various other people uh, helping with the meetings and, the, uh, you know, recruiting other people into the fold as well. Uh, people describe a, a kind of PVRI-ness, you know, it's a verb these days to certain meetings. Um, so how would you describe that quality? And what was the process of growing the organization over those 11 years that you were in? Well, I mean, I, I, I has become, you know, uh, so as Martin has always just say, you know, passionate about to continue doing it and supporting it. So Martin was kindly enough uh, helping me in appointing a secretaries. And uh, I had a couple of secretaries, but later on one of the best secretaries um, who was Nikki uh, Kroll, who was a secretary for almost nine, nine years, probably or eight years. She was actually contributed a lot to the development of this in work, in particularly during the meetings. Uh, she is so attractive, so energetic, worked from five o'clock till later on, always smiling, loved by everybody. So she contributed a lot to the development of the organization. That's number one. That's from the internal point of view. From the external, we thought that we will always do it in January uh, uh, because of the cost in general. And if we can combine it with another meeting so that we will divide the cost. Uh, as you probably know, we have done the one we did it in uh, in uh, Giesen was with the other meeting of Keys in Istanbul with another meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So just to, to, to reduce the cost because we didn't have that much money in general. But one thing which we always uh, decided and that is what answer to directly to your questions. We want the meeting to be unique that everybody contributing equally. There's no senior, no junior. If you have a good science, you are senior. If you have a good contribution, your value as good as even if you are a postdoc or a doctor or a PhD student or whatever. So one idea is to say the meeting will be slightly different and here is how it is. And this is what we call by PBRI styles or other, I don't know the word you call it. <laughs> and that is, we do not like an usual presentation which say, Mr. Chairman, blah, 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 blah. My conclusion, thank you. And everybody clap and two minutes questions and that's it. We just say, you only present 10 minutes, you present the problem, don't present too much of your data, and present what you really find and what you think are deficient. 10 minutes, but half an hour of discussion where everybody can interfere, talk, and, and during that period of time, 
you would present your data. And therefore, the so it is entirely a different way. The other thing, I don't want you to stand on a podium because it looks like you are the most important person. So you sit on your, uh, uh, you know, in, on the chair and give the presentation as if you are talking in a cafe or a restaurant or anything like that. And that created an environment of people start to feel they are really valued in my point of view and things like that. And it was loved. But it wasn't easy because people haven't used to this kind of thing. We are human beings are conservative. I mean, it is only when um, uh, Steve Archers and other colleagues took over, you know, organizing the meeting, uh, uh, they slowly, slowly reverted back to the traditional style where, you know, people give that. Although more uh, discussion is still there, better than any other international meeting, uh, but it is not that one which we used for 10 years. Oh. And because people start to compare it to the World Congress, and they say it's much better than World Congress because I can, you can hear what I'm saying, while in World Congress, nobody hears what I'm saying. It's already been established by this World Committee sitting somewhere in the room. Excellent. And then um, I guess kind of we're sort of rushing through it, but um, moving moving forward with with, uh, you know, your contribution throughout those 11 years, um, there was some handoff then to um, the late Professor uh, Glenis, uh, oh, yeah. Sheila Glenis Harworth. Um, what was her role in the beginning? And well, before uh, you go, the, uh, yeah, and, uh, I just want to mention about the journal, because that is another story, uh, if, you, if you allow me, because uh, the reason why I say that is that um, um, Jason suggested journal in Malta. And we talked about it in Marbella on the following meeting. And there was a big opposition for it. Because they said, why do I have to publish my paper in a no journal which is unknown? I can't go and send it to circulation or circulate search or whatever. So we have to give up to the disappointment of Jason. But I couldn't give up, so I said, fine. So I decided separately to establish a journal called PVI Review. And this is, I, I didn't want to call it a journal, I call it as a newsletter contribution, but I added a lot of papers to it in general. And I found, uh, you know, an Indian uh, publisher to do it. And, you know, I mean, everybody knows the PVI Review, I got it in here, one of the issues. And it was become our journal because even it is the one which we publish our annual reports and things like that to reduce the cost, you know, publishing it and things like that. Three years later, we have published it again. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this is a story because it's nothing other than to give an idea to the younger generation of how things can be the other way, you know, if they have an idea. I went to, to Jason and I said, Look, Jason, we published three years in this PBR review and it was published regularly. And it was received very well in general. I think it's a time to resurrect the pulmonary circulation. And I can tell you one thing, we can use the same company, this Indian company to do it. We are just to collect the idea, things like that. And that is how the first two years, the pulmonary circulation was published by the same uh, PVR review. And also, and, but we kept PVR review as a kind of annual report and things like that. But the, and the first issue was published a following year later, and it was phenomenal. I mean, you know, it became pulmonary circulation, as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so pulmonary circulation happened, wasn't as an easy uh, track, but of course, thanks to Jason, and enthusiasm of Jason and the great leadership and his dedication to it, it is now, uh, flourishing very well in general. Mm -hmm. So that preceded um, pulmonary circulation. PVRI review was like the, the pilot, I guess, almost. It was because of PVRI review the pulmonary circulation happens because uh, we just can uh, we, we just say it's a transition because we, it has a lot of scientific papers and some of them are still being quoted, you know, cited. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our, I mean, I as I said, I did it just because I was being asked. Um, 
been saying you don't we cannot do it we don't need any sure. journal so we just say okay this is not a journal this is just a review and things like that mm -hmm. but it is a kind of uh, going around this to get the primary circulation mm -hmm. and for two years primary circulation was published by the same publisher and then uh, of course we went to chicago and then we went to you know in general but that is natural or any journal in general Gotcha. Okay, cool. so that is. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I digress you about that because I thought that, um, of course, we had published another one, but it's only for a couple of years because of the younger people. You know, we gave you mm -hmm. I keep all these tissues as memoranda. Uh, anyhow, so. So, uh, yeah, so I mean. Yeah, then in uh, 2014, oh, I was yeah. going to, so there's been many uh, magical ladies involved with with uh, with PVRI, but 2014 was particularly, and 2015 were a, a kind of a transitionary period with two women in particular uh, who were sort of driving forces in the transition. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about? Uh... Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, uh, in 2010, I retired from Pfizer completely, so I spent almost four years doing nothing other than the PBRI. And I had an office in the University of Kent because I'm an early uh, position, but the university kindly gave me an office. So that was the office where even Nikki was there in general. And that office uh, was, uh, uh, by the way, um, uh, an office block run by a lady called Stephanie Parkway. She was running that uh, complexes of offices in general. Uh, so I was, you know, started seeing is that things getting too big, and also, it is my way of thinking is that to get something continuous, never stay with it all the time. Give it a new blood. If you keep owning this, because a lot of the people think your is only me or something like or Stuart Rich or Martin Elkins, but that is not good because you need to give a new blood and give the ownership so that everybody feels that it is part of it. If you want to be sustained, if you want it to disappear after you dis we disappear from this earth, that's fine. <laughs> that's how you have to do. Uh, and also, uh, I, I start to feel that we're getting big and we need to get in new bloods and uh, and the whole environment is changing. So I talked to um, uh, Martin and said, we need a new president. And the idea was actually to ask, we have some of the names without mentioning names, but uh, um, Glenis was one of them. Glenis was a bit reluctant uh, because uh, she was, was retired as well, as you know, at that time. But then later on, he said, look, I, I, need, I, I will accept that. And especially Glass was working with me over the years with the PVRI, uh, because we also need a female voice into the whole things. And of course, so then I sat with Martin and with Glennis and I said, but you know, uh, Nikki is a good uh, secretary, but she's overwhelmed now. And of course, there's a lot of other things. So I need a new uh, managing directors in general. To be in. So they said, yeah, that's a good idea. And at that time, you remember, I made up about a million euro into the budget. And that is through all my uh, tight way of spending money, you know, in general, to, to keep the budget. So I said, now we get a good basis to get it an, a proper organization. And, and we need a new blood coming in and new constitution. So everything, you know, just, I, between three of us, Martin, Glennis, and myself, uh, decided that. So we advertised, and we got about three. Uh, Stephanie was not with them, one of them, of course, because he didn't probably saw the end or something. But I know Stephanie, and I've seen what she was doing. So I went to her office and closed the door, and I say, Stephanie, would you like interested into this job? He said, oh. What does that mean? I mean, how secure I am in, in, in this? <laughs> Would I have to travel a lot of these things and things? She was a bit reluctant as well. But later on, after two days, she came to me and said, I, I had a thought about it and maybe I would consider it. I said, yeah. And I wanted to have any personally in general. Um, um, anyhow, so, we organized for the, I, I know Stephanie went and talked to Nikki to understand what is it. Nikki was surprised when she knows Stephanie is actually coming because she's next door to her, <laughs> you know, for, <laughs> for many years. Anyhow, uh, so we had an interview and there was three shortlisted. Um, I had, the other two were 
favored as well by you know Nick and by uh, Martin and but I did not like one of them because for many reasons a lot of them they were not local and things and I so I insisted on stepping in and trying hard things and then they all agreed and I thought that it was the greatest piece we have ever had you know in general so that is was uh, anyhow so Stephen took over uh Glennis took over and they start to work together I start to feel is that now it's the time for me to exit and do some of other things I'm interested in you know these things in behind me you got all these uh, extracurricular activities I wanted to do so I talked to Martin and Stewart and I said I'm going to resign for two reasons first of all you know I mean you know me I'm a bit Maybe if I am always there, I may not give them all the freedom. <laughs> I have to admit my weakness. <laughs> uh, and it is much better they will start themselves, and they are very able. And this is good, well known for that. Stephanie is probably good management. I have seen her doing her uh, activities during when she was in the university. Um, and uh, also uh, the vice president at that time, Paul Corris, was also just about to uh, retire, and so he will be also good. Well, they were a surprised, but I said, no, not, not at all. I will be, you know, um, being like an old grandfather, so I will just uh, go around if they need me anything. If they don't need me, that's fine, if everything is okay. So, uh, uh, and I'm always saying that to my young colleagues, if you want to keep an idea or institution or something you did for perpetuity, for sustainability, give it away. If you keep it, it will die with you. And that is not something is good for your, you know, for your legacy or your uh, contribution. And as I wanted the PVRI to remain, you know, as a powerful organization in this field, it is the right thing to do. And I think now, almost now, what's six years uh, from 2014, you know, the things of the PVRI has been moved um, is marvelous. And I think that that decision was the most right decision I've ever had. Cool. So we are. I was going to ask you about where we are today and and your thoughts on. Um, where the PVRI has gone since you've you've kind of uh, taken a step back, um, and perhaps where where do we go in the future? Do you think? Well, I mean, if we move at the same pace as we are doing now, and the name of the PVRI is now become a well established, and especially it is on the global aspects, and um, uh, I think it will become the major force for the pulmonary vascular diseases and an example of how charitable organization which has a collegiality of equal that is everybody is equal and no superior or no senior no junior at all working together in for the patients for the sake of the disease it will remain and will stay and will become stronger. Maybe slightly different than what you are having now, but that doesn't matter. I mean, after all, there is no organization remain the same uh, for 50 years. So, but as, as, as a structure, it will be probably continued. I mean, more like, like the Royal Society. I mean, the Royal Society was established in the 17th century. If what is it today is different than what was when it was established. But that, but it's remained a, a, a royal society and remain it as a force. So I'm sure it will be uh, continue as it is in general. And I hope, over the short term, the PVRI will take over the World Congress and become the major policymaker for international. And they are the people who, because they are the really global one, and they have been respected by the majority of the world. I mean, the world is not only. United States or Europe or Japan, <laughs> the rest of the world is more population and, and there are more scientists and more patients there. Than, than, so I, I hope that this will be, and I'm seeing this is coming slowly, slowly as time pass. And it particularly is that the industry has now a different attitude toward pulmonary hypertension because the condition is not anymore pulmonary hypertension. There are too many diseases under the umbrella of pulmonary hypertension. 
Cool. All right. Well, I think our time is, is almost up here. Um, Gus, when I know that you're involved in many other uh, things now uh, than just PVRI and PH, and you, you have a foundation, uh, the Boutrous Foundation, that runs a bunch of cool initiatives, uh, one of which we're very much involved with uh, the Young Investigators grants. Um, is there anything you wanted to, to plug or to say about uh, any, any well, other stuff that you've got going on? I always believe in the younger people. I was young and uh, I have been looked after as a young. And it is the way I've been looked after. Uh, 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 this is what makes me, you know, in one way or another. So I believe in the younger people. The other thing is that the younger people are more creative and they can create better signs than all of them. We have been indoctrinated with all science or, or the way we have the, and therefore our way of thinking is not as broad as the younger people. If you look at all these young uh, Nobel laureates, more of their idea come when they were young. So creating a younger people is, is my, and the younger they are, the better. And there is no, we should not say they are young and therefore they are children or things like that, but they can contribute. So I um, uh, thought about this and my belief in that. So therefore, I said I'll put some money onto a foundation for my private money as, um, to help the younger people. So we established this precious foundation. And one of the first activity we did is I established the Young Scientist Journal with the help of the teachers in the other schools. Uh, and it is now flourishing. I mean, if you go to ysjournal.com, it is the journal which is flourishing. And the interesting things, I also give it up completely, uh, mentoring it completely uh, four years ago. And it is now completely run by young people. Young people, I mean teenagers in general. And you know that we established the younger committee of the PVRI, uh, which is was very flourishing and very promising, but for some logistic reason, it did not continue. But I hope it will be reestablished again in one way or another. So the Business Foundation is still coming on and I'm now um, trying to create some prizes and some uh, incentive to the young people to um, establish themselves in science because that is how we can build science. Building science is not for what I, um, I'm going to publish, building science. I mean, I always believe in one motto is that the, great, the greatness of a man or a woman is not in himself or herself, but in their disciples. It is the disciples, if you created a lot of disciples, you create better science than you just do on you and on you. My publication will never contribute to the science, but if I spend more time creating more scientists, they can contribute three, more, more science. And that is how things will progress in future. So, Thank you. Well, um, yeah, if, if you want to have a look at uh, or look up Gazwan or any of his initiatives and his foundation, I'll link that in the show notes below. So please do check him out, as well as Pomery Circulation, our journal and all of the materials referenced today, including PVRI Review, um, PVRI Chronicle uh, on the PVRI website, which I'll, I'll link down below again. Um, but thanks very much, Gazwan. It was uh, yeah, a real pleasure learning a, a little bit about the history. Um, yeah. and, uh, I mean, it's and a pleasure. Good. It's a pleasure to talk to you, uh, Aaron, and thank you for my... And by the way, I'm just going to tell you what few initiative I am doing so that if anybody sure. is listening to this, uh, uh, we are trying now to rewrite the history of pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary vascular diseases. So anybody interested in that, I'm very happy to listen. We have some ideas. Uh, of how to do it and we are already starting doing it in general so that's one thing for the younger people if you want to establish yourself uh, uh, whatever even i'll be i'm not talking about primary attention but even anywhere in the science be very happy to listen to you for any idea please uh, you can put my email into the uh, things and i'm very happy to hear from you thank you okay all right thank you guys thank you thank you